This is a Samsung 37-inch LCD television set, model number LN37A550P3F, manufactured in 2008. This television set has a problem which is very common to this line of television sets. Now this is part of the 55 series from Samsung. This is a page from the quick setup guide for this television set. And this problem applies to all of these models. All of these TVs will have the A550 in the middle. These numbers here are the size of the screen. In this case, my model is the LN37A550P3F. But all of these TVs, from the 32-inch up to the 52-inch, apparently have this problem. On the back, there is a tag which tells you the model number. Up here at the top, LN37A550P3F. The A55, that tells you it's in the 55 series. The 37 indicates the size of the screen in inches. There are several TVs in this series with different screen sizes. Now here it tells you the type number, which is really just the first eight digits of the model number. And just below that is the manufacture date. The problem that so many of them have is when you first turn them on, it won't immediately lock on to the signal that's being input to it. What happens is the white power light goes on in the bottom, and after about 20 seconds or so, you will hear a musical chord, and it will attempt to lock onto the signal, but it's unable to. Now, any number of things can happen. You can get just a black screen, or you can get crazy vertical stripes, or you can get a picture, but very abnormal colors. Typically, you'll get no audio, or you might just get sort of a screeching audio. The uh, TV will not respond to the remote control. After about 20 seconds of this, it'll turn the picture off and it will try again. It will sound the musical chord again. It will again attempt to lock onto the picture and you may get a different combination of stripes or abnormal colors or a black screen or abnormal sound or whatever. And it can go through several of these cycles before it finally locks onto the picture. Each cycle takes about 20 seconds. I've seen this go through like uh, nine or ten cycles before it can finally lock on. In my experience, it's, there seems to be some temperature dependence. In the summertime, when the temperature is warm in my house, in the mid-80s Fahrenheit, it'll sometimes work normally. In the wintertime, when the temperature in, in the house is in the mid-60s, it will have this problem every single time. We'll go ahead and start the television set. Our little power light goes on on the bottom. And we wait for that musical chord to let us know that it's starting up. Okay, 24 seconds in. We get the first attempt. Still no picture. We can see our red light flashing in the lower right corner. Television set is not locked on. There's the second attempt. Making a screeching sound, but no picture. Now it's going to attempt it again. Every time we hear that tone, it's attempting another, another try at locking on. Still no picture. Now we just have vertical stripes. And here we are trying again. It's getting a little closer now. We get kind of a picture, but the colors are all wrong, of course. And again, we've got just crazy stripes, crazy picture. This is our fifth attempt. It's about 20 seconds each time it tries. I believe this is our seventh attempt still. Crazy colors, crazy stripes, not locked on.
Not quite. It's getting very close, but still not quite. No sound. And picture isn't quite right. Number nine. Still not locked on. Aha, uh -huh. finally got it. It took, I believe, nine attempts for it to lock on. Let's open the TV and find the problem. We have laid the television set on its face on the floor. What we're going to do first is remove the stand. And there are four screws holding that stand in place. One, two, three, and four. And with a Phillips head screwdriver, we'll go ahead and remove those. Now with the stand removed, we'll go ahead and remove the back from the television. The back is held on by numerous screws. Around the periphery, along the bottom, we have one, two, three, four. On the left side, looking from the back, we have one, two, three, four. On the right side, looking from the back, one, two, three, four. And then at the top, we have one. So around the periphery we have 13 screws. In addition, there's one screw right here in the upper center. And then on the output panel there's two, one here and one here. And then there's a small screw right here. Again, just a close-up of those again. One there, one there, and one there. So a total of 16 screws holding on the back. We're going to go ahead and remove those screws and remove the back. Now with the back off, we can see what's inside. Here we have the power supply board, the main board, sometimes called the logic board, the inverter board, and underneath this metal plate, we have the TCON board. However, on immediate inspection, I can see that there is at least one bad capacitor on the power supply board. So we're going to start there. In order to replace the bad capacitors, we're going to have to remove this board. We will start by removing all of these various cables. Now some of these cables are held in with a little latch. You want to depress that latch. There we go. Now we have the cables out of the way, and we're held on by six screws. One, two, three, four, five, six. And we'll go ahead and remove those. And now with the screws removed, we can simply lift the board out and get a closer look at it on the bench. Okay, now we've got that board on the bench. And we look over the board and we see something that isn't right. This capacitor right here, the top of this capacitor is sort of domed. It's curved. These other caps are flat. But this one is domed. That means there's pressure inside of it. That means it has failed. This is a very common failure. I'm going to go ahead and desolder this capacitor and remove it from the board. Okay, I've gone ahead and removed that capacitor. Okay, we've gone ahead and put that new capacitor in the board. So I'm going to go ahead and put this board back into our television set. Now the power supply board has been put back in. We put the television set back together again and tested it. And unfortunately, that capacitor replacement did not fix the problem. Replacing a bad capacitor is always a good idea. But unfortunately, in this case, that was not the cause of our problem. Now there is plenty of literature on the internet, which says this board is actually the problem. This is what some people call the main board or the logic board or the signal processing board. But in any event, this board is the problem. We're going to go ahead and remove that board. To start with, we have two connectors that go to the power supply board. And you depress this little tab here. 
and you kind of work it back and forth to get it out. And then the second one. Okay. Now we have a connector that goes to the T-Con board. There are little tabs here on the end. You have to depress these. And then you can work this thing out like so. And there are two connectors here at the lower end of the board. This connector goes to the power supply. And this connector goes to some of the uh, buttons and lights. You want to be real careful with these things. We don't want to break something. Probably the hardest one to get out. It seems you really have to really bend this tab up a bit and kind of carefully work it out. There we go. Hopefully we didn't break anything. And now we have four screws. One, two, three, and four. And we'll go ahead and remove those. Now with the four screws removed, we can simply remove the board from the TV sets. Now the board itself has a part number on it. In typical Samsung's, it'll start with a BN. BN 97-01985S. Okay, we have the board out and on the bench, so to speak. There are a number of posts on the internet singling out these two components right here as the culprits. First, we have this component here. This is a tantalum capacitor, 10 volts, 47 microfarads. Now the markings on mine at least say NEQ and then AS7. Well, it turns out the NE corresponds to this company here, Neo Capacitor. And the Q refers to a production date. And then the second set of numbers spells out exactly the value. Now, this is part of the F slash PS series. And AS7 is right here, 47 microfarad, 10 volt. Polarity is important in these capacitors, and the stripe on the side indicates the positive terminal. The other component, this one, is an MP2363. This is a step-down voltage converter chip. It's made by this company, MPS, and here we have a data sheet on it, and the second page of that same data sheet. Now, ordinarily, I really wouldn't have trouble removing these two parts with my soldering iron. The problem is this chip here has got a solder pad in the middle underneath it where you can't see it, and you really can't get that off with a soldering iron. You really need a hot air uh, soldering station in order to heat up the entire chip simultaneously to get that off. Unfortunately, I don't have a hot air gun for uh, soldering and desoldering. Now, is it possible that it's just the capacitor which is bad? In which case, I could certainly get that off. So I'm going to go ahead and use my capacitance meter to see what kind of readings I get on it. And that's very strange. It's supposed to be a 47 microfarad capacitor. It's reading 113 microfarads. That just doesn't make sense. When capacitors go bad, the capacitance usually goes down. I've never really seen it go up. Now this is still in circuit, so we might be measuring capacitance on something else. So in order to measure that accurately, we'll probably have to get that out of the circuit. I've gone ahead and removed this little capacitor from the circuit, and I'm gonna test it now out of the circuit. 49 microfarad, 3.8 ohms. The capacitance is essentially right. The ESR is a little on the high side. Now, these tantalum capacitors are supposed to have a very low ESR. Now, going back to the data sheet, now here's our capacitor right here, 10 volt, 47 microfarad, and it says here 200 milliohms, so 0 0.2 ohms. So, if that is in fact correct, our reading is way too high. Perhaps that's our problem. Now, I have here just a basic electrolytic capacitor but it's also 47 microfarad. 
47 microfarad, 0 0.86 ohms. So the ESR is significantly lower than our tantalum capacitor. So we could try to solder this into the circuit and see if that fixes the problem. I've gone ahead and soldered that electrolytic capacitor in where that tantalum capacitor used to be. Now this does have a significantly lower ESR than the tantalum capacitor. So if this fixes the problem, it probably means the problem was caused by elevated ESR in the tantalum capacitor. We'll put it back together again and test it. Okay, we have put the uh, main board back in and our little grafted in capacitor is sitting right there underneath the board. There is plenty of clearance for it, so that's not a problem. Okay, well with that all back in place, we'll snap it back together and see if this thing works. I've put the television set back together again. We're going to go ahead and test it out with that new capacitor. And let's see what happens. Okay, white light is on. And there's our... Ah! ah. Look at that. I've gone ahead and muted the television set. But as you can see, the TV set turned on and, and locked on to the signal immediately. None of that uh, turning on and off. So it appears that the problem was limited to that little tantalum capacitor. And the uh, down regulator chip uh, was OK. And we were able to replace it with just using a soldering iron. And we soldered in an ordinary electrolytic capacitor. Uh, which probably cost us about 25 cents. Now, if the voltage regulator chip had also been bad, we would have had a problem because we can't get that off with just a soldering iron. In which case, we would either have to go out and buy ourselves a hot air desoldering station, or we would have to send it to somebody to do the work for us. And there are a number of places available that will fix this board for you. They will desolder those parts and replace them, and it costs typically $40. Here is such a repair service listed on eBay. You mail your board to this guy. He will replace the components for you and mail it back to you. And he's charging 40 bucks and free shipping. So if you are good enough with tools that you can get the board out, but you can't do any sort of soldering or desoldering, you might just go this route. But at a price of $40, you have to kind of think twice sometimes. Now, this TV set that I just repaired is a 37-inch LCD 10-year-old television set. And you have to wonder, do I want to put $40 into a 10-year-old 37-inch TV? Uh, of course, that decision would be up to you. Um, now, if the screen were larger, like a 42 or a 47 or something like that, well, yeah. Uh, 37 inch, you're probably kind of right on the edge. But anyway, so there it is. It's available for you. If you have a capacitance meter and you can measure the ESR on that tantalum capacitor and you find that it's elevated, you might just go ahead and replace that capacitor as I did. All you need is a soldering iron. And what I did is I just soldered in a ordinary electrolytic capacitor. Now, intrinsically, the electrolytic capacitor is going to have a higher ESR than a properly functioning tantalum ca capacitor. But this tantalum capacitor is supposed to have an ESR of below 0 0.2, and we measured it at above 3.0. Now, our electrolytic capacitor was much higher than 0 0.2, but it was below 1.0. In any, in any event, it was good enough to work. I think I'm just going to leave that uh, electrolytic capacitor in place for now. At some point, maybe I'll order a uh, replacement tantalum capacitor and do the job properly. I suspect it's that tantalum capacitor that goes bad much more frequently than that other chip does. That's where I would focus my attention on first. In fact, even if you don't have a capacitance meter, you might just try soldering in a replacement capacitor just empirically because it's so much quicker and cheaper than any other solution. If it doesn't work, well, then you can always go the other route. If you do have a hot air desoldering station and you can replace that surface mounted uh, voltage regulating chip, you can order just the parts. Here we have another site on eBay, somebody advertising to sell you just the chips that you need for all of 
$10, again with free shipping. Well, in this case, I got lucky and it turned out to be just the uh, tantalum capacitor and I was able to uh, replace it with an electrolytic capacitor and get my TV up and running again. Hopefully your luck will be as good.